And I took a couple of years of language, one year here at Vermillion, and went over at the yeah. reservation at Vermillion. And uh, through that, got to know these people somewhat and made some good friends. And they were very kind in that they uh, attempted to impart into this Chamokamai, this long knife, a little of their culture and understanding and religion and whatever. And uh, see, it, if you're, they, they have such a different view of everything than we do. Their history, our history, everything. Uh, they know us quite well. We don't know much about them. But they, uh, they have certain procedures they follow. And as long as you're a, a white man and don't know it, there's no problem. But if you know what the procedures are and you don't follow them, then you're trying. Anybody in this room that's part of Nishinaabe? Um, what? All right. Um, so I'm going to do something you maybe never saw before and probably won't see again. There are among the native people, and particularly among the Ojibwe, there are four sacred plants. Sweetgrass, which they cut, braid up, and use for smudges. Cedar, which is common out here. Sage, and tobacco, asema. Whenever I go to visit one of the elders at Vermillion or Net Lake or Fond du Lac or anywhere, I always take them a pouch of tobacco. It's a sign of respect for them. Now, they wouldn't expect a normal white man to do this, but they know I know. And therefore, I have to do that. They think I was being, uh, I was snubbing them really if I didn't do that. Every time there is a gathering of any kind, there is a prayer that is said, and tobacco is offered. And we're going to do that now. Well, you can say you saw it done. This is something I can do as a white man. There are some things I can't do. I can't do the pipe ceremony. That's only for pipe carriers. But this I can do, and I'm expected to do this. And it goes like this. It's very simple. Nendisha asema aki. I place this tobacco upon the earth. Dagao dapan asema. Gechimenu megwench. Please accept this offering of tobacco. Thank you, Great Spirit. Now we're clean. Lightning won't hit us. We're all right. That's the way they told us. Interesting people. They've been here from the Paleo Indians up to now. It's been about 10,000 years. And we've been around here for 200. For 100, we've been uh, we've been busy in this area, developing or whatever it is we do. Uh, so their history and our history don't exactly coincide. I was very much interested when I moved up here, the names of lakes and how those lakes got the names. There's all kinds of... Shagwa Lake out here. It's, uh, it's really Shagawigamuk, which is long, narrow water between hills. Um, the Kawishwi, nobody knows. That's a white man's word. But there is no word in the Ojibwe language. Kawishwi, in there. Um, Mississippi. They, they laugh about that one, how we, how we messed that up. The word is Gitchi Sibi, big water. But we heard it differently. It's also the people. Uh, when the French came here, they heard the word Anishinaabe as Ojibwe. And that's what they called them, Ojibwe. When the British came here, they heard it as Chippewa. And so they called them Chippewa. And that's what most of the Anglos, we call them. They are Anishinaabe. They use that among themselves, but not with us, because we can't handle it very well. But learning about the names of lakes and why they were named, I was very much concerned with how Knife Lake got its name. And nobody around Ely knew until I talked to the native people. Oh, yeah. Pokemon, Zagayga. Knife Lake. Why? That's where we went for our rock to make our tools and our weapons. Why would you go to Knife Lake? It's all rock. Oh, no, no, no. See, Stone Age people were a lot smarter than we think. They knew 
what different stones would do and why. I want to pass this piece of rock around. This is from Knife Lake. They came from hundreds of miles to mine this rock. Uh, a lot of people, how many people have canoed up in the Boundary Waters? Knife Lake. Most of you at Knife Lake? See the quarries up there? There's 35 quarries on Knife Lake where they took that rock up. 35 of them. This cracked me up when I found that out. John Nelson, the Canadian archaeologist that teaches at Thunder Bay, did his thesis on those quarries. That's where I got that piece of rock. I, I didn't dare take it out of there because it's against the law. Um, and he told me this, and I said, Huh? Well, he was kind enough to send me his thesis and kind enough to send me a map showing where these 35 quarries are. And I went up there. Some of you may have come across the portage from Crawford Lake into Knife Lake. And about the last 50 feet, you come down steps. And I used to carry my canoe down those steps. And I used to think, you know, it's remarkable how the glacier came and clipped this off in layers. It made it nice. It's one of the quarries. <laughs> See, my Indian friends say the white man is a slow learner. He learns, but he learns slowly. Yeah. So I, I said, oh, yeah. Well, I found this stuff is in bands. It's not like white men's quarries. It's all kinds of ways they took it out. But it's in bands in the rocks up there on Knife Lake. Some of it's up about this high, some down there, some like on the portage. And they would take big stone hammers, smack that rock and break pieces off, and then they'd fashion it into their tools. Now, if you feel that, you'll feel the edge on that, you can see why it would be very useful to make tools and weapons. It takes one heck of a sharp edge. It's an unusual piece of rock. It's a silicate. If you look at it, it looks like black sand, which is what it is. Black sand that was fused under heat and volcanic pressure billion years ago, maybe a little more, give or take. The only place on the continent that that can be found sticking out of the ground is on Knife Lake. The only place. Those Stone Age people, the minute they saw it, they knew what it was and they knew what they could do with it. They were that smart. They were extremely intelligent people. Okay. I found a couple of quarries, but I couldn't find any working, so I was looking all over to see, you know, what they did there, if I find any chips or any pieces or anything. No. So I went back and I called John Nelson up at Thunder Bay and I said, John, I found some of the quarries, but I couldn't find any working. And he said, did you ever camp on Knife Lake? I said, yes. On the big campsites? No. He said, so did they. Have you ever looked at what you were standing on? Main campsites on Knife Lake have a cushion of chips, black chips like that. Over thousands of years, chip and tools. A whole cushion, a carpet. I walked over this for years, didn't know what I was walking on. They, they have found that knife lake silicate tools 200 miles west of here and 200 miles east of here. They know they traded. Uh, a lot of trade. There were a lot of people here at one time. Before we brought smallpox into the east coast and went across here and decimated them, there was a lot of people living here. Um, probably, they probably lost 90% of the population before our ancestors showed up. Uh, that's one reason why this looked pretty vacant out here. They were some earlier stuff. But we know the Paleo Indians were here about 10,000 years ago. And John Nelson went up this week, he's up there right now, on Knife Lake, taking back a perfect spear point, a Paleo Indian spear point 10,000 years old. He's taking it back and putting it back in the ground. He's working with the native people, particularly the ones from Lac La Croix. And they're telling him where a lot of the artifacts are up there, which are sacred to them. And he has agreement with them. He goes up, 
finds them, uncovers them, takes a picture, and puts them back where they were. And he has a native boy that's traveling with him and it's learning to be an archaeologist. What's going on up there? So there's, there's a lot of stuff happening. A lot we don't know about. A lot they aren't going to tell us either. Um, my friend Tommy Chosa, who was a guy I've been best with for many years, he's buried up there now. He's up on his point, uh, just off Hoist Bay. Tommy used to come in to see me every once in a while. And uh, pretty funny guy. Now, when Tommy would come in, I was the same way with, with some of the other native people. They'd come in the newspaper office, and they wouldn't walk up to the desk and say, how are you doing? they walk right past. Go to the back of the room, get a cup of coffee. Makadei Mishkiki Wabo. That's black medicine brew. See, the native people didn't have anything with caffeine in it, so the first time they took a drink of coffee, they went, whoa, what's the white man got here? Uh, and that's what it is. Well, they just call it wabo usually, but it, that's what it is. Makadei Mishkiki Wabo. So he'd go back and get a cup of coffee. He'd come back out, he'd pull up the chair, sit down, drink the coffee, and look out the door. I knew when he was ready to talk, he'd talk. I waited for him. And one time he came in and he said, Hey, Bob, what? He said, Did you see the archaeologist? I said, Which one? He said, Three of them up here in the university. No, oh, Tom, and they uh, didn't come in here. Did they come see you? He said, Yes, yes. I said, What about? He said, They wanted to know if I knew where the burial grounds were up on Jackfish Bay. So, oh, yeah, you know where the people were up there. He said, Yes. They offered me $300 to take them up there in the boat. I said, oh, that's a lot of money for a boat ride. You take them? He said, no. He said, I told them, you don't have to go that far. Just go out of town there and that first road on the right. One of them says, you mean the cemetery? He says, yeah, dig up your people. We'll dig up mine. <laughs> oh, what a shot. Then he looked me right in the face and said, how come when you're dead, you're just dead? When I'm dead, I'm an artifact. <laughs> he said, Tom, I don't, I don't understand my people. Don't ask me. I, why, why ask me? I, I don't know what we're doing or why we're doing it or anything else. But it's true. You know what I mean? He came in one time with fire in his eye. Well, usually he was, he was pretty passive, you know, but he came in one time and I could see he was upset. Something had happened, I don't know what. Finally he turned around and he said, hey. I said, yeah. He said, you know, your ancestors were all thieves. I said, that's right, Tom, and I have great respect for him because they stole the best of what? And he started giggling. I said, furthermore, we're not going to give it back. That's kind of a lousy trap we are. And then he really laughed. So we were bigger, meaner trap. Hmm. If they'd have had the guns and we had the bows and arrows, we'd still be sitting in the boats off the Massachusetts coast. That simple. Uh, that's the way the world goes. It's the guy that's got the mic that comes out on top. Usually, not always, but usually. And uh, boy, what we did going across this country. You know, I, I, I cringe every time I see one of our, our political leaders get up and start talking about human rights. <laughs> Don't do that. Our record is so bad. Now, whatever we don't want to be in that world court, or whatever that thing is. Boy, they ever come after us, we're going to be in, we're going to be right up there doo doo, you know, big time. What was it, 244 treaties with 244 tribes, and we broke them all? Uh, some of them we broke treaties one right after another. We had several treaties with the same. That was any move them off. Whatever, whatever the expedient, get them off there. And uh, we rationalized that. We invented that the term, uh, what was that? Uh, uh, they had a term for the, uh, what we were doing. Eminent uh, domain. Well, no, it was a... Uh, uh, Manifest What? Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny. That was what I was... See, I'm getting old. I can't remember anymore. Manifest Destiny. That meant we had the guns and they didn't. And it was their destiny to die or move over or get out of the way. Uh, the Ojibwe people, of course, didn't. They moved them, but they came back. They kept trying to move them out of here and they kept coming back. They didn't want to leave. They didn't want to go to Oklahoma. Uh, and... Uh, oh. We finally got them, and the way we got them was we eliminated their ability to survive out there. Uh, 
we put a line up the border so the Canadian Indians and the U.S. Indians couldn't interact very well. Then we put in fish and game laws so they couldn't get their fish that they needed to live by. They could only catch fish on a hook and line and only so many in a certain time but we were resting. And they could only shoot moose or deer whenever we told them they could shoot moose and deer. So, oh yeah, eventually they, they just dribbled out of the woods, came back. Also cut down the woods so there wasn't any there. Uh, all that those neat things. Uh, one of these, my Indian friends who was more or less a Christian Indian, he said, you know, that guy you pray to, you always say he's a just and merciful God. And you better hope he's more merciful than just or you're in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. That's pretty profound. <laughs> That's another thing. I'm not exactly sure where we're going. Or if the Lord's just going to let us go like you're talking about, we're going to just keep using things up until we explode into a mess. I don't know what we're doing. When I was a kid, there was 125 million people in this country. We thought we knew what we were doing. Now we're closing in on 300 million. What's the carrying capacity of the country? We don't know. We know exactly how many cows we can raise in a certain acre of pasture. We don't know how many people can live in here. And we're in one heck of a swivet here to try to provide for this expanding population and give them everything they think they need. And at the same time, trying to keep from using up everything we've got so we wind up with nothing. And you can see that there's a, there's a couple of archers that are coming together here somewhere. And we're liable to run into a mess someday. We also have a, my Indian friends are pretty funny in, in a lot of the things they point out, like the, our, our understanding of things, our, our uh, concept of existence. That, and we teach it in the schools. And that's a, it's a pyramid type thing with all creatures large and small up until you get to the human that's on the top. Which is a comforting thought, you know, us being humans that we, that we are the top of the chain. They don't think so. They don't have that belief at all. Their belief is that in the circle. Everything's on the circle. Man, fish, birds, animals, everything is equal in the eyes of the great spirit in that circle. That's something to think about, and that's a rather profound belief. Okay, uh, so, this has been wrenching my head around. If I had never met these people, never talked to them, I'd be great. I'd be out there developing the weed hell and doing all this stuff and making money. And, going after earn enough, whatever that is. <laughs> huh? Yeah. They're learning some things. They, 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 they learn casinos. This is kind of interesting. Some of the people I know that go out and run trap lines are working in the casinos in the summertime. And they're doing pretty well in the casino. We were talking about that one day not too long ago. So they're having coffee with them. And I said, you know, we figured you guys out in the 1800s with whiskey. And we poured the whiskey to you and we beat you out of it. And I said, you, you got us figured out with a gambling and I think we're getting it back. Yeah. <laughs> they are. They're buying yeah. land and developing it there. They've got us figured out pretty well. Uh, yeah. Anybody got it? You want to throw anything in here anytime? Go ahead. I just ramble. You know, you can see that. I'm disjointed. I'm so old, I'm lucky I can. Yeah. What do you think the, the other side of the casino thing is? What do you think that's, what do you think the other side of the question of the casino was, aside from its, what it's doing? Oh, right. the evils of the casino? Oh, well, this is T. Uh, I'm an elder in, in the First Lutheran Church here. First Lutheran Church is part of the Missouri Synod. You people know anything about churches know that it's a little bit to the right of the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, we think we think the Pope was a liberal. Uh, <laughs> oh, don't hit me. Um, the, uh, uh, 
Yeah, we've got people in our church that, of course, are violent and I gamble. And my wife and I, about three weeks ago, got braced one day coming out of the church. They heard we were over in the casino. My wife got nailed particularly, and she, she has a tendency to kind of freeze up for a few seconds before she can get her wits together. So I jumped in. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's the problem here? And she said, well, you've been over to the casino, and that's sinful. I said, oh, you misunderstand completely. This is an outreach program of the church. What? Is it this outreach to the native people? Now see, there are proud people. If we went over there just gave them some money because we got a guilty conscience, they wouldn't accept it. But see, we can run it through the casino and they figure the owner even that's theirs, you know. And they feel better about it. And we feel better about it. We gave them some, you know. We have say, well, we just bought them another, another uh, TP or we bought them another, uh, another fairway over there on the golf course or something, you know. And, uh, how do I know what the human race is doing? You look around you, know, the only thing I ever watch on TV is the news. I turn the news on uh, at night to see what kind of deviltry the human race thought up during the day. And uh, geez, we are a mess. We are really a spitting mess. And uh, I know, awful things going on in the world. You know, it's, hmm? well, and we're about to turn, we're going to beat each other on the head. Uh, this U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, I was over there in World War II. I did all this stuff. We had the uh, world press uh, people here a couple weeks back. Uh, some of you may have been to that. These, these are top journalists from all over the world, and they're sponsored by McAllister College. They come to the U.S. for several months, and they travel across the country. They stop in New York, Philadelphia. They go to all the big papers, TV stations, and everything else. And they spent a month doing that, and then they're split up, and they, they, they kind of intern at different places. Uh, we had people there from Asia, Africa, uh, Europe, all over. We've had them. And these are top journalists. There are several hundred of them apply over here, and they, they screen them down. The ones that they figure are going to get something out of this. And they, uh, they're really top-notch writers and TV people. Sharper than Dickens. This year we had a gal from Australia, among, among them, and we had um, a gal from Japan. And my boss down there, for nothing better to do, usually has me be the moderator. I don't know why that is either, but anyway, uh, we have all these people introduce themselves and kind of tell what they do. Uh, they got from Australia, uh, did her little thing, and I said, you know, 60 years ago, my division was down in your part of the country. And we used Australia and New Zealand as bases to operate from when we went out of the islands north. And I said, you're very hospitable people, very nice. And we had a good time, you know, and uh, strong beer. And uh, then I looked at that Japanese, I shouldn't have done it, but I couldn't resist it. I looked at her, I said, you know something? I said, your grandfather, or your great uncle, or somebody, and I could have been trading shots across the rice paddy. She kind of smiled a little bit and said, your, your, your troops were great warriors. They were great, they were tough, they were good. They had one flaw, they were rotten shots. Then she really broke up. <laughs> Rowan Beer, they missed. They were. They were terrible shots. Yeah? Um, that's a good spot. So we might say, what are some things that would be important? But you've been here a while. We're looking to start up this Boundary Water Wilderness Program through the school and the Y. Good. And, uh, you know, in the context of wilderness and understanding the peoples and the landscape, and from your viewpoint, what would be some, some things that young people, it would be nice for them to know? I don't know, I've got some grandsons and, and I get them out fishing and they're, and they're interested in the woods and stuff around them. Kids now are so oriented towards city life that it's not easy. Uh, I grew up in the country and, and when I grew up, uh, about 60% of the country was rural. It ain't anymore. We know, uh, you know, how uh, cows and sheep and things like that were born what happened to them and everything else. People now don't. Uh, one thing I think, uh, uh, I was kind of surprised that um, 
you know, there's a big, big uh, lawsuit going on now against McDonald's and Burger King and some of those people because they're feeding the people fat. They certainly are. And uh, my wife and I don't eat any of that. But uh, I was kind of surprised that some of the environmental groups didn't come to the aid of McDonald's and Burger King, those people, because, uh, see, they are making people extremely fat. Pretty soon they won't, a lot of them won't be able to get in a canoe and they can't make porches, so this, we're going to preserve that wilderness through our eating. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. I don't know. I just thought it. It's a terrible thing to say. In my I have to be careful where I say. I looked around pretty close. I didn't see anybody here and looked over away, so I thought, well, I, yeah. Uh, Bob, can you tell us uh, about the how the uh, uh, Ojibwa up on uh, Lac La Croix handled uh, the the border situation there, fishing. You were telling me about that one day. That one, that one story. Because people didn't realize what was going on up there. That was almost a shootout. And uh, see, well, they've been there for what 600 years, something like that. And uh, they make their living guiding. Uh, much of it guiding. There's uh, at the village there. And, uh, Croix, there's about 40 to 45 of the men that guide during the summer for uh, the resorts up there, and they did some of their own too. Uh, and then at other times of the year, they harvest stuff from around there. They go over to the U.S. side to get their firewood and their rice, um, which they're not supposed to do. And, and so when uh, and they did it with motors. So when the motor band went in, there was a row up there, and they uh, they tried to arrest these people and stuff like that. Uh, Nori Hunsey was sent in here as a Lacroix Ranger three years ago, uh, specifically to enforce that law up there and settle it, so the Indians weren't coming over on our side of the lake, and et cetera, with their motors. And Ori, being very ambitious and a new guy, went up there. And they gave him a big 240 horse inboard outboard, which was faster than anything that any of the guides had. So he went over to the village. First thing when the ice went out, they came down to the shore. We knocked to they stand there, they don't say anything to look at you, see what you're doing. And he got out, made his little speech. He said, You know, I've got this boat, this big boat, and it's faster than anything you guys got. He said, I don't want any trouble with you guys. And um, so you stay on your side, and I'll patrol my side, and uh, let's, let's don't get tangled up and don't do anything, or I'm going to have to arrest you. I said, what happened? They said, the next day there was 40 boats over on our side. <laughs> so I said, I took out after them, and they scattered, and I chased the closest one. As you get him, he said, no, not exactly. He said, what I didn't know was they took me over a reef and blew the back of the boat out. <laughs> <laughs> then things, things really deteriorated after that. It got worse. The, the, our government sent, sent a couple of guys under, under cover up there to Hamburg's resort on the Canadian side. They posed as fishermen, hired one of the uh, Indian guides up there taking fish and kept trying to get him to go across on the U.S. side. He didn't want to, was in corner. Fishing, it was in the spring, it didn't make any difference. Fishing's just as good on this side as it is on that side. They finally convinced him to go over in this one bay, and as soon as they went over there, across, they arrested him. And uh, they went and took him to the ranger station on McCoy, the U.S. ranger station, called in, they got a plane, flew him down to the boat, um, booked him down there, and uh, And they let him out. He had enough money in his pocket to make a phone call. He called Hamburg. Hamburg didn't know where he went. Didn't know where the guy in the boat went or anything went. Called him, told him he was in Duluth. So Hamburg um, drove down and got him. Boy, there was hell to pay over that because those guys went up there. They didn't identify themselves with any Canadian authorities. And he arrested a Canadian citizen. I don't know whatever happened, all how it simmered out, but it just kind of died out after a while. But the next thing that happened was 
Um, it was late in fall, and some of the Indians were doing some ricing and hunting over uh, up the uh, Bear Trap River and up in that area. And they happened to stop by the ranger cabin, and uh, some of the Forest Service guys flew in and caught them there. And they had their rifles with them. And there they were. Um, pilot called in, so we got we got a standoff here with guns. Hansi said, "Get in the plane and get the hell out of there." <coughs> and I came and said, "We're not going to have any of that ever." So nobody's going to die over this up there. We're not going to shoot anybody. And they're not going to shoot anybody. I said, "What'd you do?" He said, "I passed the word out to the Lacroix district from now on. Anytime you see him, go over there and ask him if they please leave." We wrote no more tickets, made no arrests. Been pretty quiet up there. Uh, I, at the time that this was going down, I was pretty wild, and I knew the, the, the chief up there, Justin Boshi, who was a militant and was looking for trouble. I knew him quite well. I talked to him about this thing, and they were ready to go. And here we got people on canoe trips going up to Anika. They have a clue on what's happening up there. They don't have any idea. And I remember a lot of talking to uh, Chuck Dayton one day. And Chuck's an attorney for a lot of the groups, a neighbor of mine over there on Moose Lake Road, or on the Cape Water Road. And I said, you know, they could have shut off all the canoe trips. I don't know, we shut them off. And nobody go here. What do you mean? I said, I said, you don't understand how this works. I talked to these people, I know what they could do. Let's take 4th of July, that whole area. And Critical Park West is full of campers. And those campers get up at daybreak, and nobody has a canoe. Nobody has a canoe. You know where the canoes are? They're out in the middle of the lake somewhere, full of rocks, sunk. The Indians will get up during the night to get them off. What then? You're going to have people standing out there waving t-shirts to the airplanes going over until somebody comes in. And then what? You think anybody's going to go up there camping when their canoes are all missing? You want a showdown, that's the way you get a showdown. Hmm. So they were ready to do it. Luckily, they didn't get to that. Uh, I don't. I, t I told him, you know, I'm a newsman, see, like Jim, I, I, I'm always looking for a story, too, you know. And uh, John Boshi, Justin's brother, uh, I talked to him about it, and I said, well, you know, if you make the move, if you go, when you call me, I'll go with you. <laughs> I'll take pictures. <laughs> make a heck of a story. It wouldn't be good for the people camping out there, but uh, I'll go see what's happening. They tolerate me. They don't have to like me particularly, but they tolerate me. And I get along with them. They, I get along with some of them because they, uh, they recognize the fact I'm a serviceman. The warriors are still held in high esteem, very high esteem by the native people. <coughs> when a native kid goes into the service, they hold a face for him. When he comes home, they have another one. When they have the big powwows, like the one they have in Duluth every year, the first dance is the warrior dance. They honor these people. So some of these guys I knew from the Marine Corps. Well, Jim Northrop, the uh, the writer from uh, Final Act, uh, he was a Marine. So we swapped yarns every once in a while. He was in the Vietnam War. He calls it the time he went down and fought the white man's war. Uh, <laughs> Tough guy. Great story that he tells uh, about being down there on the line one time, getting ready to go on patrol. And six helicopters came in high. Now here's the helicopters came in over the treetops and landed, unloaded, and got out of there with hazardous duty. These guys got up there and they circled way up there. So they figured it's got to be some pretty high powered people, some dignitaries or generals or something, because they're not coming down. They're looking the place over pretty close. Finally, they did come down. When the plane's unloaded, who gets out but John Wayne? So all, all, the, all the grunts came running, you know, hey, hell, and they all 
sign, sign this or sign that. They're all getting uh, autographs from him. Finally, Jim gets up there and he says, what are you doing up here? And John Wayne says, we're making this movie, The Green Berets. And he says, I come up to see how you guys operate. And he says, boy, you're lucky. He says, I'm just getting ready to take a patrol out. You can go with us. He said, it was a dead silence. Finally, John Wayne says, no, I think I'll let your professionals handle that. And he turned around and started for the plane. And John says, after all the Indians you killed, are you worried about them guys? <laughs> yeah, they look at the world different than we do. Imagine, they lived here 10,000 years and never put a dent in the ecology. And we've been here hundred and some, and boy, we've done it are pretty good. We've got to have laws now to restrict how people go and what they do out there to keep it from vanishing. Boy, well, I don't know, you're working on something, uh, you got your work cut out. And, uh, how we're going to do this, I don't know. And I don't even know if setting aside little pieces here and there is going to do it. Because if we don't take care of the whole thing, some of that may vanish along with it. I don't know what we're doing to this ecology. This country. Anybody got any? Yeah? Bob, uh, a few hours ago, a fellow in this room and I were having a conversation, and I was reflecting upon uh, having known you back in the early 80s and recalling concern there was over acid rain. Uh, it was in the press every day and how that issue seemed to put the things like truck portages and motor size and all that into uh, insignificance because you had a larger issue. And we mentioned today that we haven't heard much about acid rain in the last couple, three, four years. Do you have a feel for what's going on? Yeah, that? well that's still there. This, people are getting used to it, you know. So it's like a guy that's got treatable cancer, he just lives with it. Uh, the mercury's still in the fish. I don't know any commercial guy that eats big fish, won't do it. Uh, I don't certainly don't. I eat small fish. I'm sure Chuck White eats small fish. Yeah. He's not going to eat those big hoggies. We're going to do that. They're loaded. Uh, the Indians are so darn funny. Those guys up at LaCroix, they see their guide every day, and they're cooking fish every day. And uh, when this thing first popped about the mercury in the fish over, and that's got to do with the acid rain. The acid releases the mercury, the rock. And of course, some of it's airborne is coming in too. Um, they tested those guys. They tested all of the guys at LaCroix. And their mercury content in their body is way up there. <coughs> way up there. People say, when you want the fish? Oh, we get lots of fish. Well, I don't know what it was, because they told me. They eat fish now, but they eat the little ones. They'll, they'll take, you know, there's a little one pound of wild edge or something like that. They're very careful. And uh, their, their mercury content's gone down. The thing about the mercury in your body is that you have to keep putting it in to keep it up there. They tested some of the tourists, too, uh, that came into Crane Lake. And uh, their mercury content was rather low until they'd been there like, for two weeks. They were eating fish every day and it shot up. And then they sent hair samples and fingernail samples when they got home and it would taper off the good on again. But we don't know what all that's doing either. I don't have any idea. And uh, the acid rain is still there. Uh, hardly anybody ever looks at that, that health advisory that the state puts out on the mercury and the fish. And they list the lakes, what the, what the level is, and what fish, everything. Uh, it's not good for tourism. Lake Superior is loaded with PCBs and a few other things. Fish down there are really bad. I don't eat any fish out of Lake Superior anymore. But uh, they don't know what to do with that one. You don't see that one advertised anywhere. They got a pretty thriving tourist industry down there in Lake Superior. They're not going to jeopardize that even if they kill a few people in the process. But they, uh, they got some mercury too, but mainly it's, it's PCBs. And that came out of Duluth. That's industrial stuff. Boy, need something. And then, we, you know, we were talking about this before. We're looking at a lot of different things. We, you know, we, we got all kinds of organizations and people stuff that are trying to, you know, offset this or do something with that. And maybe something coming we don't even look at. 
We don't even know about it yet. Could be some little amoeba out there, way back in the woods or in a garbage can or something. Oh boy. I got one going here, and ain't no cure for this. When I am out on that human population lookout, I don't know. Boy, there's a lot of it. And with the, with the transportation we got now, we could move any disease from continent to continent overnight, just all over the place. Yeah? Well, one of the things uh, I forgot to show in the last two slides, it goes along with what you're talking about. Uh, last time I was up in the Arctic, I uh, was with a Anuk, uh, his name was Aaron Kimmick-Sun. I was going to show a slide of him. And Aaron, I, I queried Aaron about why people aren't eating the seals the way they used to. Keep in mind that some of these groups are, of course, named after the seal. And I said, well, you know, why, why are you just feeding the dogs? Now? And he said, uh, we don't like the taste anymore. I said, why? He said, we can taste the pollution. The elders won't eat them. We can taste the change in the meat over the last 20 years. Uh, it's those persistent organic pollutants that have made their way in the currents up in, up into the polar sea. Yeah. So I mentioned that Go on. in right. addition to what you're saying. Ron Gaysico is the medicine man up at LaCroix. Um, very interesting guy. He did all that. I used to go over and go over and why we hike up to Snake Falls and sit there and talk about um, stuff. And he told me one time that they have a real problem. Uh, the traditional people because they get all of their medicines and things from plants in the woods and he said the plants are not healthy now he said there's cankers on the leaves and things that we never had uh -huh. something you're born let's get to them oh i don't know boy i'll tell you one thing i ain't got that lot of worry about it kids you're working with, they're the ones that are going to get stuck with the problem. My generation, we had a whoopee time, you know, my generation, we dug it up, cut it down, milled it, mined it, burned it, sped it, boy, we had a whoopee time. Now the next kids are going to get stuck with trying to figure out how to make it right. We got it all screwed up. It was a good trip, though. <laughs> well, whatever. Before everybody falls asleep. Yeah. What would you say is essential? Jim, you and I wrote that story about Asher Rain. Boy, did we get in trouble with it. Remember that? You did, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we did a story for Canoe Magazine on Acid Rain. Jim took the U.S. and I took Canada. We did a, a two-part thing on it. And we, got, we, had, we researched it well. We had the information. And we unloaded it. And boy, did they come out smoking. The, the, um, the power industry came after us big time, particularly the coal-fired people. And uh, uh, they went after the, the publisher of Canoe Magazine, who contacted us and said, uh, whoa, 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 what did you guys do? We quoted every authority we knew. We didn't invent any of this stuff. And uh, so they sent us a whole pile of information. They had a stack. Like this. Remember all that stuff they sent us? They, we split it up. You, we split it up. You read half and I read half. And it came to the end and I sent back, he said he wanted a synopsis to publish it. So I sent him back a synopsis. I said, what these guys said is first, there is no such thing as acid rain. Second, if there is acid rain, they aren't causing it. And third, if they are causing it, it's too expensive to clean up. <laughs> Took care of that. <laughs> Never heard from him again. <laughs> well, well, whatever. Anyway, I had some questions. Go ahead. Um, what would you say is the essential difference in viewpoint or approach towards one's being in Native peoples versus non-Native cultures, hmm. whatever non-Native might be? I really don't know these people that well to say that. I know some of the things they feel and some of the things they think. And I'm still a shamu. I always will be. I can't, I be, I can't be a Anishinaabe. There's no way. So I, 
not growing up in it, not being part of it. I can guess at things, but I don't know. I don't know what they think about a lot of this. I know they had a couple of years ago, they had a, well, a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, when they got a real big machine right down at, uh, at Virginia, at the mines there. The uh, uh, drag lines are the, the shovels that would take one car load of iron at a crack. Oh, one car load, two car loads. Uh, and when they got all this stuff in, they had an open house down there, and they had all the dignitaries from the state, the governor, and everybody else down there in this big shindig. And just for the heck of it, they invited a half a dozen of the Indian elders from around the state. These old guys came, and, and they had a mine guy that was up there, and they were looking down at all these machines, and he was explaining everything that was going on, and everybody was going, ooh, and ah, except the Indians didn't say anything. They stood there like they usually do. Finally, this guy turned around, and he said, uh, what do you think of all this? One old Indian said, I remember when I was a little boy when the white man killed a game. And I remember when he cut down all the trees. Now oh, he's hauling away the rock. <laughs> oh, maybe that's what they think. They're, uh, yeah. Do you have any comments on the deer wasting disease and the West Nile fires? Whoop, you got to get lower than that. The deer wasting disease. Oh boy! And the West Nile hey, virus. Look, that's, we don't, there's a lot of these things coming up. Uh, unless the West Nile virus starts to croak off people by the hundreds, I don't think we're going to get too excited. Uh, the deer wasting disease that we've got, and of course we did that by by moving game farm animals around. Got that scattered all over the creation. One of the funniest stories was they had this story, you know, going back uh, a couple of months, where the state of Wisconsin. That's the only thing about being in the newspaper business. You get to laugh a lot. When you see what your colleagues are doing somewhere, they don't have a clue. Uh, the state of Wisconsin decided they were going to obliterate that down there in those four southwest counties where they found the deer wasting disease. So they, they opened the season down there and they hired a bunch of hunters, or they invited a bunch of hunters to come in and shoot those deer off. They're going to kill all the deer in those four counties, which, of course, is an impossibility. Anybody knows anything about deer knows you hunt them down about so far, you're not going to get the rest of them. No way. But anyway, um, they wanted to kill 25,000 deer right off, and I think they got about 150 in the first crack. I was trying to compute that out, and I figured maybe 10, 12,000 years they might get 25,000 at that rate. <laughs> uh, now they're trying, they're trying to do all kinds of things to get them shot off. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. Um, and they really don't know what to do with that. We've probably got it in Minnesota. It's has no reason to respect the border, and uh, they're going to be checking deer this year in Minnesota to bring them in to see if, if they're infected. I'll tell you one thing it's going to do, it's going to go the other way, because a lot of people ain't going to eat those deer and ain't going to shoot them. That's what will happen. They don't know if this goes into people or not. Uh -huh. Like we were watching some, some on TV about the other night, my wife says, what about the deer season? I said, what deer season? We don't eat meat anyway, except that's about the only meat we eat is meat or deer meat, we eat fish. But we'll just dispense with that. I'm not going to, I've been around too long, I croak myself on deer meat. My mom and dad live in one of those areas in Wisconsin, and you know, there it seems to me they're approaching it the way that a lot of things get approached. You know, shoot first and try to ask questions later. They're, you know, the big plan is to kill them all. And then what? You know, where did it come from? How do you get rid of it other than, you know, shooting all these animals? And they, gonna work. they don't seem to have a plan. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, it, it, well it's, it's a thing where, you know, it, it politically, do something. Uh, that's always the thing, you know. And of course, the press is part of that. They go to the people in charge and say, how come you're not doing something? Even if they don't know what to do, you know, they got to figure they got to do something. So they, they'll do something. You know, even it looks like they're busy. Uh, we got uh, that European water mill foil. Uh, they just announced here that we found it in seven new lakes this year in Minnesota. Whoop be do. It's coming. We'll have it all over. We may have it in the boundary waters when they get through. We, 
we've got a lot of exotics up there now. We've got the rusty crayfish up there and a few other things that move down. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I know you like like any self-respecting jarhead you wear in that, that hat, but are you also carrying a pail around with you regularly now as well? <laughs> Get moved back in. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah, I also, I also have a have a point. I uh, this doesn't have to be made out. It's made out of church. That was given me, and uh, so I don't, I don't do much of that. I, I I take this stuff around. I do a lot of talks to Boy Scouts, and uh, I had a real problem here two years ago because the Boy Scouts didn't give me back my rocks. <laughs> <laughs> on my own. <laughs> Okay, whatever. Well, thank you for putting up with all this. <laughs> <laughs>